Okay, um, welcome everybody, welcome to HLB Manjad. Um, my name is Michael Hutton, Hutton, I'm a partner here in the wealth management section of the firm. And uh, we've got a really interesting topic here tonight, a very important topic, uh, aged care. And it's something that's coming up very regularly in our discussions with clients, uh, either for themselves or maybe they're thinking about their, their aged parents and so forth, which I assume that's what all you are here for today. Yeah. Yes. It's a very young looking audience for this topic. <laughs> and it's such an important topic that we now have a whole Royal Commission uh, looking at, the, uh, at, at, at this area. This comes hot on the heels of the, the, the it's all being appalled by the Financial Services Royal Commission. And I do suspect that we're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to be fairly horrified by some of the stuff that comes out of the Aged Care Commission as well. And that report's not due until April next year, so in about a year's time. Uh, as, as a wealth management firm, uh, our, our interest in this area or our focus in this area is around the uh, sympathetically advising on the financial aspects because they are very complicated uh, and there are quite a few different planning uh, options available to people. So really getting our heads around the financial side of that. Tonight you're lucky to be hearing from three very knowledgeable speakers on different aspects of aged care. Uh, so what I'll do, firstly I'll, I'll um, introduce the, the panel of speakers to you uh, and then they'll roll through until about, probably about quarter past six, something like that, and then the aim will be to have a panel, we've got the chairs set up there, so we can have a panel and you can ask any questions that you might have at the end, so if you could hold your questions until the end so we can, can keep things flying. We'll aim to wrap up by about 6.30, after which you're very welcome to join us for canapes and drinks um, out in the foyer area afterwards. So our first speaker will be Danielle Robertson. Uh, Danielle's the founder of DR Care Solutions, and she's here to talk with us about in-home care. Now, Danielle has uh, worked in the care sector for more than three decades. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Three decades. <laughs> Far too young. Thank you. Got three decades. Uh, but Daniel uh, has an intimate knowledge of the options available. This knowledge and experience emanates from her leading Dial and Angel for many years, which was Australia's only national agency specialising in providing aged home and childcare. And, and they're also a very long-term client of our firm as well, so a, a long-standing relationship with Daniel. Um, now, she, Daniel also uh, advises senior managers, CEOs and directors in the care industry on policy and process improvement. So a very experienced lady in this space. Daniel will be followed by Cameron Kirby, who we're very lucky to have here tonight as well. He'll talk about residential care options. Now, Cameron's the CEO of the award winning uh, Mark Moran Group, uh, and they're also clients of our firm. So there's a bit of a theme there, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> uh, and this, yeah, look, widely regarded, I think, as being a leading aged care and retirement uh, living provider. And many of you might have seen the flagship facility that they've got over there at Port Clues. They're up on the, the cliff top at Port Clues. Magnificent facility there. And very strategically and conveniently located directly across the road from the, from the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> that's not part of, not part of the official bio. I just, I just threw that in. So prior to joining Mark Moran Group uh, in 2000, Cameron held senior financial and operational roles in major ASX listed and multinational companies, including Foxtel, Salmat, uh, Endemol Shine, and he has experience in leading M&A transactions and also company uh, restructuring projects. So again, a very experienced person uh, to be speaking to us tonight. And then you get to hear from our own Melinda Measday. Uh, Melinda's the director of our wealth management division here at HLB. She's a chartered accountant and she's a newly accredited aged care advisor. Uh, now, Melinda will talk about the financial side of things. And it's always good to get some numbers in there, you know, these presentations. <laughs> so she'll talk to us about how that stacks up. Uh, and she also, you get to see, Melinda has a very personal appreciation of and interest in this topic. Uh, so as I mentioned, let the speakers do their stuff. Then if we can have a, a panel question and answer session at the end. Uh, and I now welcome Daniel Robertson. Thank you, 
you to Melinda and to Michael and for having us here today. It's a broad subject to speak about in a very short space of time. So without further ado, I've just got a little um, video that I'd like you to watch and it will just set the scene for you. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. So that just sets the scene that not too many people think about death and dying. But living longer, living better, the choice is individual. My background is helping people. I come from a long line of family business. My mother started Dial Angel in 1967, and that was what Michael mentioned before. It was a home health organisation, home care. We saw a growth in the aged care and disability care side of things. I came into the business in 1986, so there's my 33 years experience. Um, and I took over from mum in 2003 as CEO. She said only Prince Charles had had a longer apprenticeship than myself, so uh, <laughs> that was after 17 years. And uh, I took the business from um, you know, a reasonable size to a national organisation, uh, 10 offices. We had 10,000 angels, 1,500 staff angels and around 75 office staff. So it was quite a large business. We sold that business in 2014. The reason, one of the reasons we sold it was we could see this tsunami of older Australians coming. And we had very high standards for our angels that did the care. And we were very concerned that we would not have enough angels to help our clients. And we didn't want to drop the standard just to fill bookings. So we decided either to put the market out, the business out to market to sell to merge with other, another business our size or start buying up smaller providers. So we were sold to a, a community care organisation. I worked with the new crew until May 2015. Decided to go out on my own and do something a little bit different because I could see there was a real need for clients to have impartial advice and, and be help navigate through this industry. It was in fact a financial advisor who contacted me and said, look, Danielle, I've got a client who traditionally I would have said, sell the family home and move into a residential aged care. But he said, I've heard so much about home care recently. Can you just come and have a chat with them about home care and what's actually involved? 
So this one financial advisor, I helped five of his clients, and three of them I introduced a home care provider to, one I helped move into a retirement village, and one I helped into residential aged care. And then I realised that there was a real need for a service like this, totally independent. The client pays me, the residential aged care facility doesn't pay me, the retirement village doesn't pay me, the home care providers don't pay me, so I'm totally independent. That's alright. <laughs> <laughs> With home care, there's an entry level home care. A lot of people have this misconception that they're all going to get government funding immediately when they decide that they need a little bit of help. That's not the case. Planning ahead and having the discussions with family members or, or relatives that you know who are ageing, start the discussions now. It's not an easy discussion to have, but bring up in a nice, comfortable situation, not that, Mum, I've noticed that your fridge is empty, or Mum, I've noticed that you haven't had a shower in a week. It's more about, let's think about what we're going to do as a family and plan ahead for the future. And that's where we work in with the advisors very carefully, because we need to plan, not just for retirement, it's about aged care. I think people forget about that. There's another big whole hunk after retirement living uh, called aged care. And to remain at home, I probably nearly everyone in the room would probably want to stay in their own home as they age. There's this fear, oh my gosh, I don't want to go into an aged care facility because I'm going to be hurt or injured or I just don't want to be, if I know I'm going in, I'm not coming out. Well, not alive anyway. So, you know, there's a concern around that. So it's actually, us not we're, we're talking about it now because a lot of the facilities are doing a damn good job. Yes, there's a Royal Commission to Aged Care, and that will prove that there's only a small percentage of bad providers out there. It's a small percentage of people doing the wrong thing. But there's a hell of a lot of good providers doing some great stuff. So we just need to be mindful of that. But going back to the discussions where you're having that discussion with your family member, it's important that you spend that time to talk about what is it that they want and what their wishes are? And that's really important not just to tell your family member what they should be doing, but ask them what they would like. And you'll find out, I've, I've had a client just recently who's a, a doctor, he's a rehabilitation surgeon, he said, I can't get through to my parents, I don't know what to say or do to find out what they want. Within half an hour of me being there, I actually found out that they want to remain at home for as long as they, as they can with quality and the right care. So it's actually listening to your clients, or your parents, or your relatives. Um, according to the Intergenerational Report of 2015, life expectancy at, 90, uh, at birth would be 95.1 years for men and 96.6 years for women by 2054. So that's quite old. My, the average age of my client is 88. One of my clients who was 102 passed away last week. She was in residential aged care and we had private care coming in three hours a day, three times a week, just to spend time with her and be a companion, take her out into the sunshine. But she was 102 and she was, it just gave her something to live for and be happy to know that there was a carer coming in a couple of times a week. And it was really good for the carer who was semi-retired and was giving back. She said, this is what I love. I'm, yes, I earn a little bit of money, this is what I love. I've, I've been matched with such a beautiful lady and heard her story at 102. It's amazing. Um, there's a few things I just have to gloss over, really. Um, with the home care packages, there's two lots. There. You've got Commonwealth Home Support, which is your initial entry point into home care. And that's only if you, if you are finding things difficult at home, such as domestic cleaning or gardening or you might need some podiatry or some other allied health. It doesn't mean that you're going to get government funding. You can ring My Aged Care, you can get an assessment through the Regional Assessment Service. They'll come out and see you. They'll ask you what you can and can't do for yourself. And they'll likely say, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll do our best, but you'll be on a wait list. So if you have some funds available, I recommend that you start the services sooner rather than later, on your own recognizance, on your own, out of your own pocket because by waiting for the government, it's not going to happen. If you're at, at further down the track and you need more assistance, there's four levels of home care. Level one, two, three, and four. Level one is around $8,000 a year in government funding. That will give you about two hours, two and a half hours a week of assistance. Level two is around 13,000, and you're getting about four and a half hours a week. So it's not huge amounts 
even for a level uh, four package at $50,000 a year, the average amount of hours that you can get is between 18 and 22, if you're lucky, depending on the provider. So it's not a huge amount. If you have dementia, you're given 50,000 from the government, but then you know to have 24 hour care, it's a hell of a lot more than that. So you may need to either get um, uh, equity release from your home, you may need to sell the home, you may need to sell an investment property, sell some shares, whatever it be, so that you've actually got some more funds to be able to pay for your care. So just to think ahead that if you do want to remain at home, you're not guaranteed to get government funding. Currently there's 129,000 people on the wait list for home care packages for levels three and level four. A lot of people are taking lower to entry packages on the proviso that they're hopefully going to get uh, higher levels later on. So you can't be guaranteed that you're going to get this. My own father last year was uh, assessed as a level four. We had him at home until he, he was a high falls risk, he had vascular dementia. He was falling constantly, he was having TIA, which is mini strokes, and we decided that we'd have to get home care to support his partner, Alice, who was, who was working 24 hours a day, and things were happening to her. She was developing blood clots. I was more concerned about carer stress and I was about my own father. So that's really important to think ahead. So I introduced home care, fee for service at our cost. But what we did is when it got to a point where it was too hard to keep dad at home, we moved him into residential aged care for a respite. And what we found is he was a high falls risk. He had two falls within two weeks of being in residential aged care. I didn't want my father restrained, so we organized for a carer to be there four hours a day, seven days a week at our cost. And then Dad's partner, Alice, would go in from 11.15, have a handover with the carer. So for eight hours a day, we had someone one-on-one -on -one with Dad. After that eight hours, we actually had to have the facility care for him. And they did their best. You know, the, the carers there did their best. They were running. They were really having a lot of difficulty because there weren't enough hands on deck. So for me, from my perspective, for my father to die with dignity, we paid for additional home care into the nursing home. Unfortunately, Dad's package never came through and he passed away on the 1st of December last year. So you can't rely on the government funding coming through no matter what. So planning ahead is really important. There are other options. There are thinking about downsizing. If you're thinking about downsizing, there's options of moving into a strata apartment, moving into retirement living. You know, some people I've spoken to are saying, I'm selling up, I'm going on a cruise ship, I'm going on the world cruise ship, <laughs> and they've got med medical attention there, they change my sheets, I've got food and drink all day, I come into ports, my kids can fly in, or go sell up and go to Bali. You know, cheap, the, the help over there is cheap in Bali. But look, realistically, there are options for you to start thinking about. Um, look, there's some fantastic aged care facilities. I've helped a number of clients into residential aged care as well. Um, I mean, the Vaucluse is state of the art, seven star, it's like a hotel. I mean, you know, for me it would be fantastic. My father would have been mortified that we were going into something like so palatial. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do need to work with the client to understand what they want and what they need. Um, sometimes it's the kids saying, yes, I want that for mum or dad, but you do really need to listen to them. So the different care options, we saw those before. Um, I've seen people uh, pooling their superannuation funds and buying a house and living together. And that was a group of women down in uh, Wollongong that I, I met. And they had very strict contracts uh, between them so that if one developed dementia, they'd have to sell their portion and move out, which was a shame because the whole reason of pooling their funds was to be able to keep them at home for as, as long as possible. Um, there's some new models of care coming out. There's a um, a, a gentleman in, in Victoria, sale in Victoria, his wife had MS and he would have loved to have kept her at home until she died but he had to move her into a residential aged care facility in her 50s. Um, after she passed away he thought wouldn't it have been great if I could have just had her in our home but having 24 hour care uh, on site. So what he developed, he developed a plan, a new model of care, it's called Freedom Key Housing and they're four three bedroom homes with the centre part all joined together and it's called the key and that's where all the care takes place. So the, it allows people to live with their family and it might be, I did go down and have a look at it and there was an older couple there with their son who has a disability. So they're all together but the parents felt it was essential to make sure their son was settled before they passed away. 
and the care takes place in the middle of this facility. It's a, a group house, really, but it was very individual. Um, and that's fee for service, but you can use your government funded home care package in that situation if need be. Um, there's dementia specific group homes. Group Homes Australia have a very similar sort of um, uh, concept where it's a residential home. It's been retrofitted, but it's got 10 rooms and the centre is where the living takes place. But there's care on site, there's three carers 24 hours a day and a registered nurse comes in on a regular basis, I think daily. But that's not government funded at this stage, but you can bring your home care package in on that. Um, there's palliative care and a lot of people want to die at home and sometimes that's feasible, sometimes it's not. We're finding that a lot of the facilities are now offering palliative care so that and, and really beautiful palliative care in the facilities to give people a lovely end of life. Um, and as I said, if all else fails, sell up and go on the world cruise ship. There's lots of innovations to support Australians staying at home. There's lots of new um, equipment that you can buy and have access to the internet to allow you to um, stay at home and have, you might not need 24 hour care, but there's alarm systems and monitoring systems that can help you. There's internet based telephone systems for social socialisation, because socialisation is one of the biggest killers, I think, for people staying in their own homes loneliness. So there's new innovations all the time coming through that will help you to remain at home for as long as possible. And sometimes it's not always possible to do that. So how I work with clients, I usually get a referral from an advisor and I work with the advisor and the family together. And I undertake a care needs assessment so I understand what the client's physical care needs are, their cognitive care needs, their spiritual care needs, their social care needs and we pull together a holistic life plan. And then we talk about different options and what they're, what they're thinking that they would like to achieve. Often this is as a result of a life event that we saw before, and then things have to move very ahead. You have your life plan, you know what's ahead. If you do have a life event, that you can then enact that life plan. So the second part, so after I've developed the life plan, the family can go away and digest that, look at the recommendations and start thinking about whether they want to move into a facility or downsize into retirement living or whether they'd like to start home care. Often once a life event does happen, that's when the implementation happens. So I'll help people navigate the aged care industry. So help them with government funding as well as um, finding the right care for that individual. And it might be, for an example, I had a client who lives in London, Her daughter, the daughter lives in London, the mum's here, she's Filipino Catholic, and she said, I want Filipino Catholic carers to look after mum because she goes to church, she wants the food that she used to like eating, and um, she goes to the cemetery each day to visit her husband's grave. I put it out to my care provider network, I came back with one provider that said they had two carers, Filipino Catholic carers, what a match. The, the daughter in London could not believe that we were able to find the right care for her mum. So it just depends on listening to what the client wants and needs, also listening to the kids, but also the main thing is to listen to the people themselves and really make it a broad understanding of what that person wants. If they've lost capacity, it's a bit different. And the children or the powers of attorney or enduring guardian will need to think about that sort of thing. And that's another thing, estate planning. I can't believe the number of people that don't have wills or current wills. It's absolutely essential to have it. If you've got assets, if you've got siblings, if you've got children, if you've got parents, you need to have a will. You need to think about enduring guardianship and powers of attorney. Powers of attorney help you with your financial decisions. That's great, no problems if you lose capacity. But the enduring guardianship is all about your care, health and accommodation decisions. So that also needs to be made sure that you've got the right people doing that for you. And certainly think about an advanced health directive, which is a living will. So if you develop something like motor neurons disease and you're unable to speak, or if you're unable to communicate and you don't any, want any further treatment, that needs to be documented. Because if you don't have that, and I think Cameron's going to be discussing that a little bit later, that somebody else can come in and make those decisions on your behalf. So. Just winding up now that there are plenty of different options available to you. Don't panic, plan ahead. If you've got a person who's in hospital, had, who's had a life event and the hospital saying, get them out, get them into a care facility ASAP, I always say slow the process down. 
Let's just think about this. It's a massive financial decision that you are making on the fly. So just slow the process down. I'll often, if the hospital is desperate to get that person out, we'll try and find respite to allow us time to work out what the right thing situation is. Often I've pulled people out of respite back home with care by just slowing that process down. They haven't needed to go in for permanent care. The respite was enough time for us to allow to actually work out what we wanted and what we needed and what was right for that individual. And they're often then at home for another 18 months to two years longer than they would have been if they'd gone in there permanently. So it's just trying to find and listen to what that person wants and trying to find the right care solution. And I'm free for questions later on or you can, if there's a brochure out there you can take, give me a call. If there's no charge for a call, I'm happy to have an hour on the phone with anyone and go through your particular situation, guide you and support you. And only if you engage my services, then charges apply. Thanks. Uh, hi everyone, um, and my name's Cameron Kirby, I'm the CEO of the Mark Warren Group, and uh, thank you Manjad for inviting me to, to speak to you today about retirement and aged care. So here are our co-founders, uh, Mark and Yvette Moran. Um, and they, Mark Morin, you may have heard of the Morin Group or the Moran Group, they pronounce their name Morin. Uh, so Mark, Mark ran the family company for about 10 years before he sold it. Uh, the, the, the company still exists, but his brother runs it. So Mark and Yvette set out to create their own company, which is the Mark Morin Group, uh, different from the, the Morin, Morin Group. And, uh, and they had a very bold vision. So we believe age is to be celebrated and enjoyed. Uh, it's proven to be the happiest time in people's life and, and so we really believe that people should be making the most of their life in, in their later years and, and we're committed to bring a, a vibrant lifestyle you know, with a holistic approach to, to care. So as Danielle mentioned, um, I can't emphasise enough how important it is to, to get an enduring guardian and, and a power of attorney, enduring power of attorney in place. Um, in this space, if you don't make the decisions, somebody else will make those decisions for you. And, and all of those decisions and all that control will really be taken out of your hands. Um, and if, if you don't have somebody in place, it will be the public trustee that takes over things. And uh, in my experience, they're, they're really been terrible. I really would not recommend to anyone that they deal with a public trustee, apologies. Um, but um, but uh, I've, I've really I've had so many experiences with them and, and not a single good one. So uh, so I always just mention that it's really important. Um, this is just a book. Um, we've only got 20 minutes here. And aged care, retirement, home care, all of these things, they're extremely complex areas. And, and many people that, that are dealing with them are confronting them for the first time. And, and they're often, particularly in aged care, they're, they're confronting them in, in a time in crisis. Um, and, and people are often really can't believe how complex it is and, and I, government couldn't really make it any more complicated in my view. This is a fantastic book. Rachel Lane is a financial advisor um, you know, with an aged care background. Neil Whitaker, you'd see, he, he writes in the, in the papers. Um, hopefully they've updated, it's probably a few years old now. Um, they may have updated the, the version. Very simple to read book. Really lays out everything to do with home care, aged care, retirement care. Uh, ACAT processes, funding processes, you know, really very easy to read book, so just uh, just suggest that to you. So HPR really consists of, of three areas. You have uh, the retirement living or retirement village area, you have home care and you have aged care. Um, and, and certainly in the last few years we've, we've seen a, a convergence of those coming together. So um, home care is receiving home in your, in, uh, sorry, care in your home and, and the government funds that through the, the federal government. Aged care is obviously uh, aged care facilities, nursing home and retirement villages uh, uh, have evolved and I'll go through that in more detail but they've really evolved from being um, an alter like an alternative to apartment living um, to, to being you know, something a bit more really, we're seeing low care happening more, more in retirement villages. So just what is a retirement village? So, so a retirement village, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, they're communities where, where senior people, people that traditionally over 55s, although 
in most cases they're much older uh, than that. Uh, the average the average person in our Pool Blues facility is about 83 years. Um, they've got state government oversight. Uh, they've really evolved from developers, Lend Lease, Stocklands, they're pro property developers um, that have really developed uh, luxury type lifestyle communities. Um, most of them don't do care. Um, so the residents need to then organise their own care, it's where Daniel comes into uh, play. They don't have any licensing requirements, there's no accreditation agency oversight. There's many different land title options, some of them are freehold, some of them are strata, some of them are leases. Um, and as I was saying, they're really becoming more of low care facilities these days. And, uh, and, and we're seeing what's called a co-located environment where, where people are starting, you're starting to see aged care and retirement operating in the same site. And, uh, and I personally believe if you're looking at a retirement village option, uh, you, I would really strongly recommend that you look at, at, at one that has an aged care facility on site because it really provides you with that continuum of care. Um, whereas otherwise you've got a, a, a retirement village, you have to then exit the retirement village, you then have to sell the apartment to someone else. It's a really painstaking process. And then you're moving again into, into another aged care facility. So really, the financial considerations, really just briefly again, so that you, you pay a, an ingoing contribution, which tends to be the sale price that allows you to buy in. They tend to be deferred management fees. Again, there's many different retirement village models again, but, but this is the most typical version. Uh, you pay a, defer, a deferred management fee, and that fee is normally, it goes towards the, the, the management fee for the, the operator, because their other fees don't have any profit in them, and in many cases they make losses and it also goes towards the capital upkeep of, of the village. There's also monthly charges, which in, in most villages, uh, they act a bit like a strata fee. So they're the actual costs of running the village, includes the, the village manager, includes uh, you know, all of their IT systems, maintenance, all of those things that tend to happen. And then they pull for them together and divide them you know, amongst all the residents. Residents tend to have budgets, residents vote on them with AGMs and everything, and, uh, and that, that then forms the monthly fee. You then also have to consider what the capital gain and the buyback options are. Um, and again, there's various models. There's some of them attached to what the exit price is, some of them attached to what the entry price is. Um, and then you have other user pay charges, so whether there's additional care and other things that, that are provided as well. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about both the, the retirement village sector, which is a state, a state government um, overseen um, sector, um, has had its own set of uh, problems, or you know, certainly a, a lot has attracted a lot of attention in the media and with the government. And the aged care sector, which is a federal government uh, jurisdiction, has also had a lot of a lot of attention on them, and, and they've been approached in two different ways. So in the aged care, we've all heard about the Royal Commission. In the, in the state in New South Wales, in any case, the state government ordered an inquiry into it. It was headed up by Catherine Greiner. Um, that inquiry made 17 recommendations, um, and, and this is the report. If you're looking at retirement living, I would encourage you to read this report. Um, I think it will certainly go into a lot of the, um, the problems, the pitfalls that, that, that many people would experience in, in, in a retirement village. Um, and, and it was certainly great education in terms of you know, going in eyes open. Um, so most of the recommendations are focused around transparency, providing clarity around fees, certainty of buybacks, dispute resolution, accountability, and, um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about how we're, our approach to that in, in a second. So the government has, sort of, has looked at that report, received it, and, um, and they've made a, a number, they've announced a number of reforms. So the reforms that are going to start on the 1st of July include annual contract check-up meetings, uh, emergency plans, annual evacuation exercises, safety information, order appointment. Um, but, but they've failed probably the bigger issues that people um, tend to, to worry about. And they tend to be about uh, the resale of their apartments um, and, and those sorts of financial considerations. So the government have flagged changes that they'd like to make um, relating to those areas, but they haven't actually done anything about it yet. So um, I think they had to get elected first, and, um, and then I'm sure they'll start having a look at that. 
Um, but fair trading, the Department of Fair Trading oversees retirement villages in Australia and certainly I've referred to their website to, to also find out more information about it. Okay? So our approach to it, I mean, we were, we were pleasantly surprised and I've, I've met and spoken with Catherine Griner as well. Um, our, our ethos as a business um, is already, we're already doing all these things. I mean, that's just the way that we approach things. So, so we're, we're very big believers in being upfront with everyone, being completely transparent with everyone. Uh, we don't want anyone to have any surprises. And so, and having come from an aged care, the aged care area into the retirement area, uh, we're able to sort of bring a lot of the aged care concepts into the retirement area as well. And so all of our fees are known up front. They, they don't change, there's no surprises. You'll know exactly what you're paying from the very beginning. Um, our monthly fee is fixed for life. So before I was talking about how people, they meet every year, they go through a budget, they have a big argument over what all the fees are. Our approach is that we want to we want to eliminate all of those sorts of arguments and so we just fix the fee uh, for life. We guarantee the buyback. So in many villages, it, it may take two, three years in worst case scenarios, and many of the sort of stories that you see on a current affair involve exactly this problem, where uh, they, they leave the village, they might be in aged care, they're paying all the aged care fees, and yet they're still paying all the retirement village fees as well, because it's taken them a long time to be able to sell their apartment. Um, they've got to refurbish it, and that becomes their problem. We believe that, you know, we want to align our interests with our members and we believe that if we're providing a really good product, then it really should be up to us to resell it. And so, so we, we try and resell it within six months. If we haven't reselled it within six months, we give them their money back in any case. Okay? We stop our fees as soon as the apartment is handed back. So as soon as people have moved all their furniture out, it takes a day, hand the key back, that's it, they're finished. So our fees stop. Okay? Uh, we pay for all the refurbishment costs. So again, it's, it's, we run the facility. We believe that if, if we're running a really good product, if we're doing everything really well, then it really should be up to us to be able to take on all that risk and, 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 and resell it. And so, so that's our approach to it. In the event that you need to move into our aged care facility, which is normally what happens in most cases, um, that person will move into the aged care facility the person, the family normally, moves all their furniture out, they, they hand the keys back to us, and our fees stop in, in retirement, but we immediately transfer that, that sale proceeds amount, the income contribution, gets transferred into the aged care lump sum, the RADS, which I think uh, Melinda is going to be talking about. So, so what that means is that it's, it's, I'm not aware of anyone else that does this, um, but, but what it means is that we don't believe that people should be paying Twice. We don't believe that we should be double dipping, um, and so we move from from retirement into aged care. They start paying aged care, and and they end all the retirement uh, fees. Okay, so the aged care side of the business um, again, it's uh, very very different. It's derived from the hospital system in Australia and in most countries, um, and what what used to be referred to as nursing homes. Um, even more complicated, much, much more co complicated than, than uh, retirement in terms of all the regulations. So it has federal government oversight. People tend to have to put down a lump sum amount or they have a, a, an option of paying an interest amount and I'll let Melinda go into that in more detail. It's funded through ACFI, which is the aged care funding instrument, complex funding system that basically uh, you, you, people are scored in terms of what their care requirements are in three domains, activities of daily living, behaviour and complex care. And there's, there's pretty much 64 different funding outcomes that can come out of that and, um, and that determines how a, a, an aged care operator is funded. There's a, the, the oversight is through an accreditation agency, so an accreditation agency will big accreditation process every three years. If you get a clean bill of health, they'll accredit you for three years. If you don't, then they won't, and, and they'll have further follow-up work. They then have a whole lot of visits that they do. They have, um, you know, have unannounced visits, they have announced visits. They can turn up in the middle of the night, they can turn up on the weekend, and, um, and they start going through, um, they, they look into all, all sorts of different areas of it. Um, and, and I think they've learned from the Banking Royal Commission, because they're approaching that uh, really quite ruthlessly with, with aged care operators now. I think they're worried about the Royal Commission. And, and so you're seeing more and more operators that are being sanctioned or, or issued with non-compliance. Um, the people who work in aged care facilities uh, are subject to a number of requirements. So, so aged care operators must be registered as an approved provider. 
uh, we must hold their licences, which the government allocate in what they call rounds. However, there is a market for them. They cost about $75,000 per bed if you want to buy an aged care licence. Um, so the accreditation was spoken about that. So aged care standards, there are 44 outcomes over four standards. However, there are new standards coming into place from the 1st of July 2017, eight standards. Um, and st all staff that, that come into contact with residents have to have police checks, although there's been a lot of discussion in the media about making that a national, having some national um, information systems because, um, and even international, because you, you may get international people that you know, may not have had any problems in Australia, they might have had some overseas. So. So there's generally two types of care in, in aged care, certainly the most popular two types of care, and, and Danielle again touched on it. So you have what's known as respite care, and respite care is, is temporary care. Um, it tends to be people, that, whether a, a carer has carer stress, they might need a break, they'll put you know, a partner or a parent into aged care. Um, and, um, and so the, the government provides 63 days of funding for, for temporary care, respite care. Um, many people use it as a, as a bit of a try before you buy as well. So many people might go into respite for a couple of weeks um, before they then decide to go into permanent care. Even though there's 63 days of temporary care, it's pretty hard to find an aged care facility that will offer you 63 days. They tend to only offer a couple of weeks. Um, and, and that's just because the, the limit, limited beds and, and normally people wanting to become permanent as well. So after the 63 days, you may have extensions. So talking about public trustee, classic example of the public trustee is that they'll tend to burn through their 63 days. They'll tend to burn through another three or four extensions. And then that, that resident will tend to have to be paying for their own care unfunded because the public trustee has taken a year to try and organise the financial arrangements of it. And so that's just an example of what we tend to see with the public trustee. With permanent care, permanent care is, as it says, it's permanent, but, but it's only it's, it's permanent on the provider. It's only as permanent as the resident wants it to be. So permanent care provides the resident the right to reside in the aged care facility for life. Um, however, they may exit the aged care facility at any time by simply providing 14 days notice. Okay? So if they're not happy with it, they simply provide 14 days notice. They can go to another facility, they can go home. And so often people don't realise that the term permanent you know, seems much more permanent than what it may be. Um, they also are entitled to 52 days of social leave a year, so they might go home for Christmas, they might go on holidays or weekends, and they have un unlimited hospital leave too, where the, the providers must keep their beds secure. Um, tends to be two types of aged care facilities, certainly under the regulatory framework, they, they tend to be, you have non-extra service facilities and extra service facilities. Extra service is a concept that the government introduced um, several years ago now, and they were really just trying to provide greater levels of service, greater levels of things, uh, of, of options for people. Okay. So we currently have two locations. We have a little bay location, um, it's a 155 bed extra service facility, but we do also offer some concessional beds at Little Bay, and, and concessional beds tend to be people that, um, that, that have low means, low financial means. Um, also people that, are, that are, may have a partner living in, in a house have a lot of protections that the government provide as well that may, may also have them um, allocated at, or assigned as a, as a supported or a concessional resident. And then we have our facility at Bull Clues which is um, about two and a half years old now um, and uh, that's, we have uh, 91 aged care extra service beds and rooms, all single, all, both facilities are all single rooms with en suites. And we have another 90 apartments, um, retirement apartments as well. So we also have two other locations that we're looking at. So we have the Shire um, in Karimbar. The, the blue marked area there is, is the, the it's about, uh, 16 to 18, including some duplexes of residential sites that, that were purchased down there next to Sutherland Hospital. We also have an aged care facility at, at Warrawee, the about 105 beds that, that uh, we're, we're uh, just waiting on the, the completion of the DA there as well. Okay. So look, uh, we've won many awards. Um, the, these are the awards that we've won over the last few years. I mean, the, the ones that I'm particularly proud of is the, the UDIA, it's a very pre prestigious uh, property award uh, that we won for excellence in seniors living. 
We also won the Fairfax PwC Aspire Award for Outstanding Staff Culture, and, and we've won the Asia Pacific uh, Facility of the Year. We've won that a few times now, actually, and that's judges, judges from America and from all parts of Asia as well. So Paul Clues, as I said, we've got 90 apartments, 91 aged care rooms. The, the greatest um, benefit that people see in Ball Clues is it provides a full continuum of care and people tend to go there because they never have to move. And uh, they also receive a whole lot of extra services. Again, we do things very differently. Complimentary cleaning, uh, laundry, groceries. We provide complimentary groceries, shuttle bus, security concierge services. Okay, I just want to mention couples because couples is a really important thing. Most people go into aged care end up getting separated. One of the great things about the, the co-located model is that you may have somebody suffering with very, even very severe dementia. Uh, we have a number of them at Paul Clues where the, 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 in all instances it is the husband who has dementia and, and that person then goes into the aged care during the day but he's able to then return home with his wife and, um, and they, they spend the night in the apartment. And, and, and so we, we try and maximise independence as much as we can and we certainly try and maximise choice. So look, I'm, I've only got a couple of minutes left, but I thought I'd just sort of flick through and just give you a bit of a, 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 an idea of the Ball Clues facility. Um, again, we're doing one similar to Ball Clues in, in the Shire as well. So, so is our atrium and our cafe. Very pet, pet friendly, pets are really important. Uh, so we have our bar, um, uh, very uh, residents come and, and have the bar. And uh, we, uh, this is, these are our lifestyle team here that you see here. Um, so our Botanica restaurant, uh, very popular restaurant, it's said to be the most Instagrammable restaurant in Sydney. We have, actually have people go there with changes of clothes so that they can take a change of clothes and take lots of photographs of them and put it up on Instagram. So there's our piazza entry here, our garden. So we, we, very much, we very much believe in integrating with the community. So we want our residents to feel part of the community. We want the community to feel part of, of our facilities as well. So here's our, uh, we, we have East Egg Fun, Family Fun Day, so we had that last weekend where we've, I think we had about two or 300 people there, um, kids doing Easter egg hunts, needs to come and be part and, and visit their, their, their parents, grandparents, stay with their grandparents, which is quite common, um, as well as just have the community come and, and, and see it and energise the whole place and, and create this sense of vibrancy because of uh, again, another show of gardens, our market gardens. So we actually have market gardens where people grow their own vegetables and we use that in our food. We have kitchens, so, so on each of the aged care floors, but we have each of them have a domestic kitchen and, and the, the food is, um, is prepared there in those kitchens fresh. Uh, big light wells, natural light running throughout the whole facility. And uh, here's our pool, very popular with members doing laps, aqua aerobics. Uh, we have uh, an Olympian that, that does swim lessons there for, for the members and the residents. Aqua aerobics is extremely popular. So all, all of those things are provided and, and they're all part of it. So. so that's it for me. So thank you. And I look forward to questions later on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nokia's. That's no kids in Adelaide. <laughs> um, so they made the very brave step to, to move to Sydney when they retired and to be closer to, the, to their grandchildren. My father died shortly afterwards and then in 2007 my mum was diagnosed with brain cancer, secondary from lung cancer. She made a pretty good recovery after surgery and lived a reasonably independent life at home. Um, but about four years ago the cancer came back and she decided to seek further treatment. So as she became more frail, we organised some private home help, completely unaware of any government subsidies that were available. Um, and that worked out for a while, worked out okay for a while. She got a bit more quirky. Uh, the carers kind of came and went. Um, it was less than ideal. And um, then in between, in between agencies, uh, she had a fall. So, and that was me supposed to be looking after her, but I was busy doing other things, working. 
looking after three teenage girls. Um, so the palliative care team at St Vincent said, come in, come in and we'll assess her and she can have a rest here. And that, that was a great relief. Uh, so in November 2015, I put my devoted daughter hat on, packed her a small bag and helped her say goodbye to her home. We, we knew it would probably be the last time she saw it. Uh, and uh, settled her in St Vincent's and then put on my super mum hat and um, drove home, hosted my daughter's year 10 pre's party for 40, wow. 16 year old girls. <laughs> um, so yeah, I definitely was part of the sandwich generation and looking after three different generations. After a few weeks, the, the, the reality was she was too sick and frail to go home and live, live at home, even with a great deal of help. Health and mobility was, had gone down to just about zero. Um, but she was not sick enough to stay at palliative care. <coughs> and it was a very brief conversation I had with, one brief conversation with a social worker there. Um, really the only option was an aged care facility. facility. Here's a list. Here's the access cab service that you can use to get her there. And um, could we please have the bed by Friday? And that was the middle of December. So with zero knowledge of the industry, because as of course it was not on her radar to ever um, be part of the aged care, uh, be an aged care resident. I had no idea where to start. I had work deadlines, uh, a pre-Christmas wedding in Melbourne to go to. So I had two, maybe three, da three days to find um, a bed in an aged care facility that specialised in palliative care, to visit and compare them all, negotiate a contract, work out how much it cost, who was going to pay, um, so name tags on all mum's clothes, try and find her glasses that had gone missing somewhere in all the moves. Uh, mum did not settle. She was, she was paranoid and frightened and frail, immobile, confused, disorientated. It was not a very nice 12 weeks. And, and really her health declined and she passed away within a, within a few months. They advertised themselves as a palliative care nursing home. I, I didn't believe they really were. And, and, I, and I ask everyone here tonight, if, if this is your case, make sure you talk through what palliative means to the nursing home you're, you're considering. I felt it was all a really slightly clunky end to, to someone who lived a reasonably dignified life. So when HLB recognised there was a need for someone with knowledge in this sector um, to become part of our firm, and I was happy to put my name forward. Now I've been at Manjad for a long time, looking after self-managed super funds, and I know a lot of people in the audience tonight. But I was really thrilled to be able to um, skill up and use my personal experience to help others navigate the, the financial aspects, at the very least, of what can be a pretty emotional and bumpy journey. So now I see my role here as an aged care financial planner and to listen to your story and circumstances and then review the financial situation and use our knowledge of the aged care industry and associated legislation and financial background that we already have here to provide you with guidance and some options so that you can find the best care possible for your loved one. Now that might be nothing more than, than a half hour telephone call to go through what, what you're thinking, right, right across to a full written statement of advice for some really complex um, options that you're, that you're faced with. Um, but I'm not going to sew on anyone else's name tag. <laughs> So this afternoon's aim, or this evening's aim, is to outline for me how the government helps with care, and, and I'll run that through very briefly because I think Cameron and, and Daniel have mentioned that um, really, really well. Introduced you to some of the more common ac acronyms, because there are many, and run through the cost structure of residential care because that can be quite complicated. And then, and then I'll put a few other examples of of someone entering at aged care at, at different um, asset levels. And finally touch on with some, some practical tips and traps for, uh, around the, um, in particular the RAD, the, the re refunded or accommodation deposit. So 
this is my little diagram. Um, again, and Daniel's already discussed with you, but we, can, we start with the uh, Commonwealth Home Support Program. That's, that's a, a Commonwealth funded home support for basic care, cleaning and, and um, gardening and what, what have you. Um, so that's subsidised for everyone, but, but also everyone will contribute um, to that as well, depending on how much they can afford. And then for more formal home care, there are the, the home packages, again, Danielle mentioned. Um, there may be a, a long wait list to get onto that, and, and there's a limit to how many hours a week that, that you'll be um, able to get. And of course on the left there's still private care, which um, it, it is immediate, and then can also be a top up for the other care packages. So unless you've got someone living at home that can really fill in all the gaps with care, and I'm, and I'm sure that's how most care starts. Um, I imagine most carers are unpaid, probably, a, a, you know, um, helping um, the government billions of dollars with uncared, um, unpaid carers. And then finally, if, if, if the care needs are too much, then there's residential care at the end, uh, respite and permanent, which Cameron has gone through. So if I can just look at the residential care fee structure, it's in four main parts. Uh, we've got the uh, refundable accommodation deposit, or the RAD, on the left. Then the basic daily fee, which is, which is what everyone pays, no matter what your, your financial means. Um, and then there's a means-tested care fee. Uh, the level depends on your means and the level depends on your medical, you know, the level of care you need. And then finally, um, the residential aged care facility may also add on an extra services fee that, that Cameron mentioned. So, so the accommodation deposit is pays for the bricks and mortar, pays the, for the accommodation, tends to be higher if the facilities are newer and, and um, shinier. It can also be paid as um, an, a, a daily fee. So the government has set down that the, the daily fee equivalent is 5.96% of the DAF uh, over 12 months. So you're paying sort of interest on the deposit. You can pay part of the RAD and pay part of it as a, as a daily payment, or we call it a, a, a DAF. You can pay all the RAD and no DAF, or you can do something slightly more complicated called RAD to DAF, where you pay some RAD and then the DAF and sometimes the other costs can come out of the RAD. And so, so the RAD you've got in the, in the bank sort of, you chip away at it over time. Uh, the basic daily fee uh, pays for the, the living expenses in the home. It's again set by the government and reviewed annually. It's currently $50.66 a day, and everyone pays it except at 85% of the uh, age pension. Then the means tested fee is quite a little bit more complicated. Its level depends on, on uh, your income and asset levels, and it depends on your care, level of care needed. It can be up to $240 a day if you are high means and high care person. But it is capped at $27,232 a year, that's reviewed annually. And there's also a lifetime cap, $65,000, 65,367 at the moment. Say that again. $65,367 per annum. Oh, no, sorry, lifetime, that's the lifetime cap. Now, if you've had a home care package, some of, the, um, some of the costs you pay towards the home care package um, count towards these caps. So remember that when you're entering residential care, that there may be some um, credits that you've got to tell them about so that they can uh, calculate this means-tested fee correctly. 
But then finally, the, the additional services fee, Cameron mentioned, that it can either be zero or uh, anywhere between $10 and $150 a day, depending on the home. Uh, and But it's normally between about $40 and $70. That's the most common level. Um, and that is for, that pays for the extra things. So the glass of wine, um, the fabric tablecloth, um, and all the amazing facilities that Cameron was talking about with the, with the Mark Moran um, lifestyle facilities. So if I can just go through what all that looks like in numbers, because I'm the numbers lady tonight. I've got four examples of different people with different different means. But I will, you all want to know what it costs. So firstly I have Janet who's been busy as a missionary most of her life and hasn't, hasn't, doesn't have any savings and, and, is, and is renting at the moment. She'll have to choose, um, probably have to choose a residential facility that doesn't have um, the extra services fee. <coughs> She's a full age pensioner with very few assets. So she does not have to pay the RAD. She pays the basic fee. Everyone pays the basic fee. She pays no means tested fee. There's no, uh, uh, my example has no extra services fee. So she will be paying $18,491,000 to, to, to live at, at her um, nursing home. And that's roughly 85% of her age pension. So everyone in Australia will be able to, if, if they need to go to a nursing home, they will be able to go no matter their means. But if you have more money, then the government expects you to contribute um, to, the, to, to your living expenses and to, to the home. So I've taken Bob as another example. The RAD at his nursing home is $550,000, that's quite a common RAD because it's, it's the level uh, above which um, the, the nursing home has to get special approval for. That equates to an $89.90 uh, daily accommodation payment. He still pays the basic fee. His means tested fee um, is calculated at quite low, $1.37 a day because he doesn't have a lot of savings. And, and he's on a full age pension, but he does own his own home. The, the uh, uh, aged care facility he's chosen has an extra services fee of $45 a day. So I've got these from live examples, but I honestly can't remember which, which one I got that one from. Uh, so total daily care, total, total, total daily fee, $186. That equates to $68,000 a year. So he's going to have to make some decisions at some stage. He'll probably live there for a year on his savings um, and his pension, but that's about all. So that'll be a, a, a conversation to have. Terry is a self-funded retiree, so he's got more money. He owns his home, he has no uh, age, age, age pension, and he has chosen um, a nursing home that has quite a large RAD, one and a half million. So you can see the daily payment for that, $250. Again, he pays the daily fee, everyone pays that. His means tested fee is a lot higher because um, his savings are higher, his deemed income is higher. Um, but notice it's capped at $27,000 a year. So I think $84.87 a day works out to be like 11 months or 11 and a half months. And then it will be capped. The extra services fee in this one, I think it's Montefiore, like Brantley, I dropped it down from, is $67 a day. So he is up to paying, it's the first year he's there, he'll be paying $155,000 to be there. And then if he stays there for three years, or then he hasn't got any credits from his home care previously, that, that'll drop. I think I've got $128,000 a year once he doesn't have to pay the means tested fee anymore. And then finally, if Terry um, decides to sell his home to move um, to move into care, and then pays the full uh, full accommodation payment as a rad, 
then he, he won't have to pay that daily fee, uh, daily accommodation payment, and the, the annual fees drop to, to seventy thousand dollars a year. Um, so yeah, they're the numbers for you. <laughs> Go home and perhaps a little more idea. And 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 it's fascinating to see how big the spread is. And it would be even even more like sometimes the rate is even higher, not not often, but uh, there's a couple of places in Sydney that, that has a higher rate. Won't name any names. <laughs> <laughs> also had low ones. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. There's something for everyone. Um, so just a few residential care tips and traps uh, that I came up with tonight that I wanted to share share with you. Um, that if you can't afford the full RAD, like don't be don't be put off. So in my mum's case, like she didn't want to go to a residential care facility, but you know they talk about a church and everything, and she thought you had to have a million dollars sitting in the bank for that for that RAD, and that you could <coughs> enter residential care without paying the full 100% amount. You know there it is, Melinda, just in case. Um, but that's not it's not the case. Uh, you can you can pay it as a as a combination, um, and then I would also say see if you can um, look into respite. As the others have said, that it's it's less expensive to start with. You only pay the basic fee when you're in, in respite care. It's a lot less expensive, and it buys you time, and you can try before you buy. Uh, the contracts that you sign to go into the the facilities are, are lengthy, and just be wary. Don't tick the full RAD box unless you know you're definitely paying the full RAD. By ticking the full RAD box, um, legally you're saying you're going to pay it, and if you're the uh, power of attorney that's ticked that and then the money doesn't come through, um, the nursing home can, can um, you know, demand it from you. So if you're not sure, don't tick it, that's okay. You can tick it, you can pay it all later, you can pay part later, and you can just leave that box blank for now. Uh, and also seek legal, and, legal or financial advice before you pay the rent on behalf of a loved one. So you know, often is the case mum and dad don't have a lot of money but um, son or daughter have made good in life and they're happy to pay you know, a million dollars for, for dad to go into the right care. And just be really careful if you're going to pay, pay something like that on your parents' behalf um, because if the parent passes away, that rad is paid to the estate, um, and then you know you might be a bit cross with your siblings for getting, you know, equal share, basically equal share in that rad. So uh, there, there are other ways around it. There are other ways to fund your parents' um, um, retirement living, but don't just step in and pay it all at once. There, there may be a family argument afterwards. And finally, uh, uh, take a full circle, get, make sure the estate planning is up to date. Make sure you've got an enduring power of attorney and uh, the enduring guardianship.